Welcome to the Home Time Project Center. I'm Dean Johnson. And I'm Joanne Liebler. In this videotape, we'll show you what you need to know about plumbing to take on a wide variety of home projects. We'll explain the basic principles of a residential plumbing system. We'll show you how to cut and join plumbing materials, how to install the most common fixtures, and how to repair different types of faucets. We'll get started right after this. Home Time is made possible by Chevy Full Size Pickup the most dependable, longest-lasting full-size pickup on the road. At Home Time, we believe the best way to get the job done is to use the finest tools. And the Chevy Silverado is one of our favorites. Equipped with an optional Vortex 6000 V8 engine, it generates 300 horsepower and 355 foot-pounds of torque to power you through the toughest jobs. And with an available fourth door, you've got lots of room for all your other tools. And friends to help you use them. At home or on the job site. For work or play. It's no wonder we at Home Time count on Silverado, the truck, to get the job done. Silverado, from Chevy, the most dependable, longest lasting trucks on the road. We'll begin with the basics of plumbing, and for that, we'll go to the site of a new house that's under construction. We timed this visit to fall after the plumbing rough-in, but before the drywall installation, so we could show you all the pipes that make up a home's plumbing system. That includes the DWV, or the drain waste and vent pipes, as well as the water supply pipes going to each fixture. The fixtures come later though, but now let's talk about what each one of these pipes does. The two copper pipes are supply pipes. They bring in the hot and the cold water to the sink. This white pipe is the drain, and it's made out of a rigid plastic called PVC. And the pipe that goes above that is the vent. Now all these pipes tie into the two basic systems of residential plumbing the water supply system, and the drain waste vent system, also called DWV. Pipes are installed in the walls and floors to keep them hidden, and pipes from neighboring fixtures are sometimes hooked up to a larger one to minimize the use of pipe. Well, here's an example. The drain underneath this toilet flange and the shower drain are hooked up to the same drain, but to show you that, we have to take you under the floor. Now the shower and the toilet drains both travel through the ceiling joists, and the toilet drains into this three-inch pipe, which is called a soil stack and the shower travels across here where it hooks in with the whirlpool and the vanity drains which in turn tie into the soil stack so that means we have four different fixtures that are being drained through the soil stack which goes all the way down the wall through the floor and into the basement down here in the basement the pipe continues through the wall and then goes underneath the slab before we poured the slab we shot some footage so you can see how the stack ties into the main house drain that's the four inch pipe that drains all the house systems it carries waste outside to a septic tank or a municipal sewage system. The slab covers up the drain here, but this clean-out plug is still exposed. We can unscrew this here, and it allows us to clean out any clogs. Now, these are required at the base of all stacks and along horizontal runs. The soil stack serves not only as a drain, but also as a vent. It goes up through the ceiling and through the roof. Down the basement here, let's take a look at the water supply system. In this home, it originates in a private well. It's pumped into this pressure tank, and once it's hooked up, it'll be distributed throughout the house in lines quite a bit smaller than the DWV lines. Most of the supply lines have been laid out upstairs. They're made of copper, with the main runs three quarters of an inch in diameter, and the branch runs a half inch in diameter. Like the DWV pipes, the water mains branch off to service several fixtures. The pipes usually run in pairs, with hot and cold water pipes going to fixtures like sinks and tubs. But some fixtures, like toilets, need only a single cold water pipe. The copper tubing is fairly stiff. At the same time, it still needs support on longer runs. Here you can see a piece of copper tubing has been wedged in between the two joists. And where the tubing goes through a hole in the joist, insulation has been stuffed in the hole to keep the pipe from rattling. Well, are you ready? Yep. Well, that should give you an idea of what's involved in a plumbing rough-in on a new house. Now we'd like to give you an idea of what a plumbing rough-in is like when you remodel or add on to an existing home like we did on one of our past projects. We had already taken out the old plaster and reframed the new walls, so the first plumbing job involved taking out the old cast iron drain pipes snaking through the old part of the house. We worked with a licensed plumber on the new plans and took out all the necessary permits before starting this part of the work. It's important to remember that residential plumbing is closely controlled by local authorities because of its impact on public health and sanitation. 
In fact, building codes in your area may permit only licensed plumbers to perform even the most common installations or repairs. So be sure to check with your local inspectors and get all necessary permits before starting any work on your own. Once the old pipe was gone, we determined where each of our new fixtures would go and then cut holes as needed to allow the new plumbing to go through the floors, the ceiling, and the walls. This graphic shows the basic layout for this particular project with the drain pipes for each fixture colored dark green and the vent pipes colored light green. Notice how the vents rise up and connect to the main soil stack well above where the highest drain connects to the stack, as required by plumbing codes. Codes also require that each drain be fitted with a trap, which literally traps and holds water after each use to keep sewer gases from entering the house through the drains. Most traps are P-traps secured in the pipe under the fixture. To keep water from siphoning out of the trap, each drain is vented with pipe at least half the diameter of the drain pipe, but no less than an inch and a half. The stack itself can serve as a wet vent for any fixture less than 30 inches away from it. But there are restrictions on the number of fixtures you can run into a single stack, so check your local codes on that as well. There are two types of plastic commonly used for drain and vent pipes. One is known as ABS, and it's usually black. It's fairly easy to cut with a hacksaw, but on a large project, cutting it with a miter saw makes sense for both speed and accuracy. Before gluing, make sure there are no burrs left on the cut pipe. Now, there's a special glue for ABS pipe that you apply to the outside rim of the pipe and the inside of the fitting. Then push the fitting over the pipe and twist it into position to spread the glue. Work fast because it sets up quickly. PVC is another common material used for drains and vents. You cut it the same way as ABS, but the gluing is different. There's a purple solvent that you apply first to the pipe and fitting to clean the surfaces. Then you apply the special PVC glue to each piece. Once the DWV pipes are finished, then the next step is running all the water supply pipes, starting back at each fixture and running down to where they can be tapped into the existing water mains. The best way to cut copper pipe is with a tube cutter whose cutting wheel scores the pipe as you turn it. You tighten the wheel down as needed to deepen the cut and keep turning until the pipe snaps. Before joining the fittings and pipes, you eliminate the impurities by reaming out the fitting with one off the end of the pipe with an emery cloth. Next, you apply a paste known as flux to each surface you're joining. Then you sweat the joint, as plumbers like to call it. Solder is used to seal the joint and it comes on rolls. Hold the end of the solder near the joint while keeping your hand well away from the flame. Once the joint's hot enough, the end of the solder will melt and the flux will help it flow easily into the joint, sealing it tight. Wipe off any excess before it hardens. That should give you the basic idea of what a plumbing rough-in involves. Now let's move ahead in the project and talk about some of the most common do-it-yourself fixture installations. How's it going in here? Oh, pretty good. We finished off the walls in the master bath. We've installed the vanity and the countertop and set all the tile, which we're now protecting. Our next job is to finish off the shower. And we'll start by removing these plastic covers that have been protecting the valve stems. These are the handles of scutcheon and shower head that we'll be installing. In fact, we'll be installing the which will snap over the hardware. I'll take these escutcheons and you can have the adapters. Okay. The escutcheon and the gasket slide over this holder, which then goes on the support and screws in flush with the wall. There you go. And the handle adapter that comes with the valve assembly slides into the handle like so and snaps in place. Here's the other one. We set the handle position by tightening the valve screw, and we secure it by screwing down the handle screw. And we finish by snapping on the ceramic cap. All right, now we're ready to finish off the shower head. We're putting this Teflon tape around the threads on both ends of our shower arm like so. I want to wrap it around about four times. That should give us good seal against moisture. Oh, thanks. Now we take the long end of the shower arm 
and screw it into the shower arm fitting we installed during the rough-in. There we go. And the shower head just screws on top of that. Well, there. That does it for the shower installation. The toilet, the whirlpool, and the vanity supply lines. The nice thing about these is you're able to shut the water off at the fixture if you want to do any work on it without having to shut the water off in the entire house. First, we cut the cap off the copper stub. Now remember, we've still got the water shut off to this area. Then we put on a slip nut and a ferrule over the stub. And we screw the nut onto the threaded end of the shutoff valve and tighten with a wrench. With all the shutoff valves installed and turned off, we can now turn on the water to the new system next to where we connected it here down in the basement. The way we do this is turn on the main valves that we installed earlier. That should do it. With the water on, we can test the shower and clear the supply lines of any particles or dirt that might have settled in them. And later, we'll clean the filter that's in the shower head. It's a good idea to do this with each of the fixtures after you've installed them. We're all set to put in some more fixtures. I'm going to start installing the toilet here. But first, I have to do a little work on the flange. We have to chip out the floor mortar that seeped in here where the flange bolts will rest. And we can slip the bolts into the slots and anchor them with washers and nuts. Finally, we can tap out the flange's protective plug, which opens up the drain. The toilet is made of vitreous china, and this model comes in two parts, the bowl and the tank. And underneath the bowl is the discharge opening. And we're going to need to seal that up, so we'll be using some wax rings. Now this wax ring has a gasket on it, and that's going to slip over the opening and make the connection to the drain. Now normally, you would only install one ring on a toilet. We'll be installing a couple because our toilet flange ended up a little low on the finished floor. The mortar came up a little bit higher than we thought. So consequently, we'll be installing a couple rings and this will ensure us a nice tight seal. All right. Now we've got the ball and we're going to place it over the flange and line up the holes in the bottom of the base here with the bolts. Okay, let's Oops, see that one. And then give it a little quarter turn with a crescent wrench. Now we want to rock the toilet a little bit to help seat the ring into the flange. And once that's firm, we want to check it for level and then tighten down our bolts. Okay, right there, that's good. Okay. Now you don't want to over tighten the bolts or you could crack the china. The tank goes on next and the main thing is getting this drain lined up with the hole that's in the bowl here. Now we line the holes in the bottom of the tank up with the holes in the ledge of the bowl. The holes are for the bolts that go down to anchor the tank to the bowl. Rubber washers make it watertight. We secure the bolts with nuts from underneath, tightening with the pliers below and the screwdriver above. I've just cut this chrome-plated copper pipe to serve as our supply tube for the toilet. Now this is flexible tube and I've already bent it to fit into place. We use a ferrule and a nut on the cut end to secure it to the shutoff valve. Then we line up the washer on the I tighten both nuts down.
When you flip a switch, you expect the lights to come on. We all do it so often that we take for granted all the elements that have to work right for those lights to come on. These elements, wiring, circuit breakers, outlets, switches, and lights, aren't difficult to understand or install. In this video, we'll show you the materials, tools, and techniques to wire an outlet, a room, or an entire house. I'm Dean Johnson. And I'm Joanne Liebler. Welcome to Home Time. Home Time is made possible by Chevy Full Size Pickup, the most dependable, longest lasting full size pickup on the road. At Home Time, we believe the best way to get the job done is to use the finest tools. And the Chevy Silverado is one of our favorites. Equipped with an optional Vortex 6000 V8 engine, it generates 300 horsepower and 355 foot-pounds of torque to power you through the toughest jobs. And with an available fourth door, you've got lots of room for all your other tools. And friends to help you use them. At home or on the job site. For work or play. It's no wonder we at Home Time count on Silverado, the truck, to get Remember that depending on the project you're undertaking, you might need a building permit and inspections. And these are important, legal, but in many cases work done without these can void your homeowner's insurance. So check with your local building department to see what's required in your area. Most of the time if you own your own home and live in it, you can do your own wiring. But if you have any doubts at all about your project, you should consult with the building department or hire a licensed electrician for an hour or two to go over your plans with you. On this tape, we'll talk about wiring new construction in a demonstration kitchen, installing simple electrical devices, and extending an existing circuit. When it comes to the practical matter of dealing with electricity in your home, you really just have to remember three words. Hot, neutral, and ground. And three colors. Black, white, green, and copper. So there are really four colors. Oh, and you forgot red. But we'll get to that later on. These terms and colors are standard in all new wiring across the country. Steam is used all over the world as an efficient, dependable heat source. One of its most common applications is warming air that has been drawn in from outside. The warmed air may provide comfort control, or it may be used as part of a process to raise the temperature of or to dry a product. No matter what the application, the reason steam is preferred is that it is so controllable. Steam temperature may be raised or lowered by changing the pressure. Steam pressure can be adjusted, in turn, by a control valve, operated remotely by a signal from a thermostat or similar temperature-sensitive device. A steam air coil that is part of a properly designed, installed, and maintained system will provide years of dependable service in any location, under nearly any condition. Steam air coils are often placed in low-pressure modulating systems. Modulating systems are those in which the steam pressure is adjusted or modulated to provide the required increase or decrease in leaving air temperature. As with any steam heat exchange system, condensate is created when heat is transferred from the steam to the air passing across the coil. What makes modulating systems a special challenge is the fact that the pressure inside the coil can fall below atmospheric, even when condensing steam at a fairly high rate. In air heating systems, if the condensate is allowed to collect when the incoming air temperature is sufficiently low, the water freezes. In severe cases, coils and piping can even be ruptured. Most substances expand when heated and contract when cooled. Water, however, differs in that it expands not only when heated, but also as it begins to freeze. Ice forms as a film, sealing openings in a system before the water core freezes. 
If these ice caps become solid enough before the core freezes, the expanding water pressurizes the system, lowering its freezing point. If the ice cap doesn't give, the core can generate enough pressure to burst whatever vessel is holding it. Even lines that can withstand hundreds of pounds of steam pressure can be shattered by freezing water. Non-freeze coils are designed to avoid freezing in exceptionally hostile environments, but even these will freeze if the system design allows condensate to build up in the coil when incoming air is below freezing. In warmer weather, when freezing isn't likely, flooding is still likely to cause two other problems, water hammer and corrosion. Water hammer is usually detected by the noise it creates. It is generated when a flooded or partially flooded system receives a shock. Thermal shock is generated when steam bubbles pass into a cold flooded area. Steam can occupy approximately 1600 times the volume of an equal weight of condensate. When hot steam contacts the cold condensate, it immediately collapses. The water rushes into the void from all sides, impacting in the center and sending shock waves in all directions. These shock waves weaken coil tubing and can actually rupture the coil. Corrosion is likely in flooded coils when carbon dioxide, a gas common in steam systems, is trapped. Carbon dioxide combines with condensate as it cools to form carbonic acid. An accumulation of this acid can destroy piping and equipment. There are a number of steps you can take to protect your system against these problems. Since we have yet to learn how to control the weather, the most obvious approach we can take is to prevent coil flooding. Freezing, water hammer, and corrosion occur only if the system is allowed to flood in the first place. All of these problems can be prevented if the system is properly designed so that it will not flood. In order to do that, we need to be acquainted with the general configuration of steam air coil systems and the role of each of its specific parts. Armstrong has assembled a demonstration air handling system with glass piping for use in its seminars on condensate removal. The demonstration system has a number of valves which allow it to be configured to represent almost any piping option. The system is now configured as a typical gravity drain system with no back pressure. Steam is taken from the top of the main and enters the system through a strainer which removes dirt from the steam. A drip leg and trap are required whenever a branch line exceeds 10 feet. This branch is dripped by an inverted bucket steam trap connected to the blowdown of the strainer. The IB is used here because of its excellent dirt handling capabilities. Steam then passes through the modulating temperature control valve, this one pneumatically operated, on the way to the coil. A thermostatic air vent is located at the top of the coil above the outlet. These devices are open when the steam system is cold. When the steam is turned on, air in the system is evacuated until the temperature surrounding the thermostatic element rises sufficiently to close the vent. The air vent helps ensure that no air will be trapped inside the coil during startup. Air that is trapped in a coil creates cold spots, reducing efficiency and increasing the likelihood of corrosion. The coil should be drained by a steam trap which handles the startup air load and fluctuating condensate levels of a modulating system well. Armstrong recommends float and thermostatic traps in this low pressure modulating application. The trap should be connected to a drip leg that is fitted with a dirt pocket. Sizing guidelines for the trap can be found in Armstrong's publication Steam Conservation Guidelines for Condensate Drainage or in Armstrong Software Program 1, Steam Trap Sizing and Selection. A vacuum breaker should also be installed at the coil outlet because vacuums first form at the coil discharge. These devices open to atmosphere whenever a vacuum forms within a coil. This draws in outside air, breaking the vacuum. 
They are piped to atmosphere rather than to the return line in order to avoid drawing condensate into the coil from a flooded return line. A vacuum inside the coil will prevent condensate drainage from the coil to the higher pressure outside of the system even when the trap is wide open. A vacuum is surprisingly common inside the coil of a modulating steam air system. Assume our demonstration system is being used to heat makeup air. Currently the control valve is supplying the coil with steam at 15 psig. This is the corresponding pressure for the 250 degree steam needed to achieve the appropriate temperature rise in the outside air. Assume the heating load is reduced due to a brief January thaw. The control valve throttles the steam pressure until the new required steam temperature is met. This could be about 205 degrees if conditions are right. The pressure necessary for 205 degrees steam temperature is below zero PSIG inside the coil. Since the coil is a closed chamber, the control valve can throttle and maintain pressures less than zero PSIG. If the system is not designed with this in mind, condensate backflow can occur. Consider that steam is still entering the coil, but is condensing at a rate that holds the vacuum. With a vacuum in the coil, it cannot drain and soon floods. It is possible for a coil in this condition to be subject to 75% of its design operational condensate load, yet there is no pressure available to push the condensate through the trap. The installation and proper maintenance of a vacuum breaker is the first step in preventing coil flooding. For modulating systems, Armstrong recommends an F and T trap with an integral vacuum breaker to simplify piping. With the outlet of the trap connected to a gravity return system, you can expect years of trouble-free service if proper maintenance procedures are followed. In actuality, many steam air heat exchangers are not supplied with true gravity drain systems. Even if the system was designed with a gravity drain in the first place, years of expansion has probably led to an undersizing of return lines. Also, scale and corrosion in the lines tend to decrease flow area in the return line. Both of these problems create back pressure, which is sure to cause coil flooding if proper precautions are not taken. Flooding is also almost certain in modulating systems if the condensate is elevated. It takes one pound of steam pressure to lift a column of water about 29 inches, so as a result of elevating condensate, back pressure is created. If the pressure modulates below the amount required to elevate the condensate to the return line, the water backs up into the coil. If it can be avoided, do not elevate the return lines. If elevated return lines are necessary, or if back pressure is present for any reason, install a vented receiver and an auxiliary pump to push the condensate when sufficient steam pressure is unavailable. If pumping is impractical and you have a system with back pressure, two problems will occur which require additional precautions. First, you must install check valves at the outlets of the trap and the air vent. These check valves prevent backflow through the trap when the back pressure exceeds the steam pressure. The backflow would flood the coil, once again leaving it open to the damages of freezing, water hammer, and corrosion. Secondly, in order to remove any liquid from the coil that collects above the trap while it can't open, you must add a safety drain. A safety drain is a second trap that is located between the coil and the primary trap. This trap is vented to an open drain or to atmosphere. If condensate is unable to drain from the primary trap for any reason, it backs up in the drip leg until it reaches the level of the safety drain, which opens, draining the system. In this manner, condensate is prevented from accumulating in the coil. In summary, freezing, water hammer, and corrosion are three common problems in steam air coil systems that can be prevented by proper installation and maintenance. First, 
provide the system with clean, dry steam. Second, connect a thermostatic air vent at the top of the coil above the outlet. Third, install a vacuum breaker on the discharge side of the coil. Fourth, use an F and T trap to drain the coil. Fifth, return the condensate to the boiler by gravity or with an auxiliary pump if possible. Sixth, if an elevated return is necessary, provide check valves and a safety drain for the system. By following these guidelines and consulting the Armstrong Technical Report on steam air coil installation, you can reduce the likelihood of flooding in your system with all its accompanying problems. As always, please contact your Armstrong representative if you need any further information or assistance. This presentation will cover control valve sizing. Notice the topics to be covered are listed here. They include valve terms, an overview, the importance of picking the correct valve size, pressure drop, what's the correct pressure drop I should take across the valve. We are going to size water systems, steam systems. We'll take a look at a CV problem. Also, there's going to be a discussion on one-third, two-third applications, their advantages and disadvantages. And lastly, we're going to select a valve. The following is a few valve terms that you will encounter in this presentation. The first one is cavitation. The definition reads, the forming and imploding of vapor bubbles in a liquid due to the decreased, then increased, pressure as the liquid flows through a restriction. This is not the way a flow goes through a valve but it portrays the way the pressure would change that it goes through a very, very small valve. Here, the static pressure would change to velocity pressure as it's going through the restriction. As it goes through, the decrease in static pressure produces vapor bubbles. As they go through, when they reach the high static pressure on the other side, they will collapse and implode when that happens, it has a force of somewhere around 100,000 PSI and will actually take chunks of the valve with it. Obviously then, cavitation is something that must be avoided when control valve sizing. The second term we're going to talk about is feet of head. In this example, you can see the pump schedule, all these ratings are in feet of head. However, when we size valves, we must, we must know the PSI. How do we do that? Take your feet of head times 0.433. So in this first example, the 100 feet of head here times the 0.433, this then becomes 43 PSI. Close off pressure rating is the last term to be covered here. This rating indicates how much pressure in the line developed by a pump can this valve close off against. This rating, which is actually force, 
is entirely dependent upon what actuator is chosen. The larger the actuator, the more force, and the greater the close-off pressure rating. This term will become important when selecting a valve assembly is covered. The relative importance of temperature controls has increased rapidly in recent years. Why? Well, basic changes have occurred in construction and economics. Air conditioning, which was once a novelty, has become commonplace. The construction of sealed, immovable windows in modern buildings has made accurate controls a necessity. Economically speaking, good controls are essential to counteract rising fuel costs. A demand for satisfactory comfort without waste has made not only good control valves a must, but also increased the importance of correct application of those valves. In the final control of temperature in a heating or cooling system, three options exist. They will be covered here. The first, you can vary the speed of the air across, let's say, a coil. In this example, a face and bypass damper varies the flow of the air across the heating coil. The more air that flows across the heating coil, the hotter it will be. A second option is to vary the flow of the water through a coil. In this example, the valve modulates to change the gallons per minute and the pressure into the heating coil. The more flow into the coil, the hotter our temperature. The third, the third option is to vary the temperature through the coil. In this example, the mixing valve modulates to change the temperature of the water sent to the coil. The more this valve is open to the hot water supply, the hotter the coil and therefore the hotter the temperature. Two of these options are dependent on good water control. In turn, good water control is dependent upon the valve. In fact, the valve is the only variable we have to make the system operate correctly. The valve might be considered the fine tuning adjust for our system. This only occurs if the valve has been properly sized to the system. Improper sizing of valves comes in two categories, undersized or oversized. An undersized valve becomes obvious when the system has insufficient heating or cooling at design conditions. This type of problem usually produces excessive noise for the valve in the full open position. Valve damage due to cavitation also becomes a distinct possibility with undersized valves. Of the two categories of problems, undersized is less common. Oversized valves are not as obvious and therefore a more common problem. The system has poor control with this type of problem. In fact, control is only achieved when the disc is close to the seat near shutoff. Since such a small portion of the valve's lift is used for control, the actuator must hunt for the ideal position. Hunting is the major symptom of an oversized valve. Besides poor control, hunting, other problems can result from an oversized valve, rapid wear of seat and disc, and a greater cost than necessary in purchasing valves. Each valve is given a flow coefficient, a CV rating, which is determined by its construction and testing. The precise meaning of CV is the flow rate in gallons at 60 degrees Fahrenheit water that will pass through the valve in one minute at one pound pressure drop. Basically, the larger the CV, the larger the valve. Choosing the correct CV is how one chooses the correct valve. Finding the CV for water systems is different than finding the CV for steam valves. Both are covered in this section. Looking at the formula for water systems, which by far is the more common, only two variables exist. The gallons per minute and the pressure drop. The gallons per minute is determined by the pump or the coil. So in choosing the correct CV, the correct pressure drop must be taken across the valve. Pressure drop may be defined as the amount of water or steam pressure dropped solely across the valve. Looking at the example, 20 PSI is coming into the valve. It must be determined how much pressure should be dropped across the valve to accomplish proper control. But how does one know what the correct pressure drop should be for a given application? This chart will help to determine the correct pressure drop. It's based on application. 
Again, remember that the pressure drop is the only variable available to get the proper CV. This chart will be described in detail in the next few moments. Basically, there are four major control applications. They include two position control for both water and steam, proportional varying the flow of water, proportional varying the temperature of water, and the last section to be covered is proportional control of steam. Here's the first section. If a valve is used in a two-position or on-off application of either water or steam, a low pressure drop, 10%, is desired. Why? When an on-off application, the greatest concern is not throttling the flow, but simply starting or stopping the flow. Therefore, the valve in the full open position should pass most of the pressure onto the coil, radiator, or whatever device is used. Looking at the chart under two position, it is advised that 10% of the available pressure be taken or line size. Here are two applications of a two position valve. First, a two position two way valve is used for zone control with radiators. If 20 psi is available, a very low pressure drop of 10% or 2 psi is taken across the valve. Another application for two position, this time using three-way valves on a four-pipe system, also requires a 10% pressure drop across the valve. The next major control application is proportional water, where we wish to vary the flow. This requires a high pressure drop. We have these choices to compute a high pressure drop. Either 50% of the available pressure is taken, or a pressure drop equal to that across the coil, or a 5 PSIG minimum where possible. Five specific applications of a high pressure drop are given here. First, a two-way valve on the return side of a two-pipe system. Next, here's a three-way mixing valve on the return side of a heating coil. Another application for a high pressure drop would be a diverting valve on the supply side of a coil. Or a diverting valve in an application with a cooling tower. And last off, in a primary secondary system, the mixing valve here requires a high pressure drop. There are two notes attached to the requirements for a high pressure drop. Here's the first one. It's the maximum pressure drop, and it's a formula. Let's use an example to see how this works. Let's say that we have 25 PSI coming into our system. Notice in the formula, we have our maximum pressure drop equals half of the quantity of the inlet pressure. Now, this has to be an absolute. So absolute, then, you must take the inlet plus 14.7. In this case, it would be 39.7. Minus, this PV stands for the vapor pressure. We can find the vapor pressure from the chart below. If we have a temperature water of 160 degrees, let's find this on this chart. 160 degrees is here, 4.7. By multiplying this all out, we will find that the maximum pressure drop that I can take in this application is 17.5 PSI. What happens if I exceed that? I will have cavitation. A qualification must be made when referring to the valve pressure drop equaling the coil pressure drop. Note 2 states that the temperature drop across the coil must be taken into consideration. A coil with a temperature drop of 60 degrees must be figured out differently than a coil with a 40 degree or a 20 degree temperature drop. Note 2 gives a small chart indicating the multiplier to use on the coil pressure drop for different temperature drops. As an example, if a 20 degree temperature drop across a coil has a pressure drop of 3 psi, as is shown here, then the multiplier I would want to use is 3. 
taking this multiplier times the pressure drop across the coil will give me my valve pressure drop. In this case, the 3 times the 3 gives me a valve pressure drop of 9 psi. When proportionally controlling water, why is 50% of the available pressure taken? Well, let's take a look at three examples. Here's the first one. Let's say that we have 20 psi is in our system coming into the valve. Our coil over here needs 10 psi to be at full heat at design conditions. The valve here then is very small. A very small valve produces a very large pressure drop. In this case, let's say the pressure drop is 15 psi. Now, wherever the throttling plug goes, whether up or down, it really doesn't matter. Mainly because it will never achieve a pressure equal to the 10 psi that I need at the coil. This is an undersized valve. And it's very uncommon, mainly because people realize that they have insufficient heating or cooling. Here's a second example. Let's use these same numbers. If I have 20 psi coming into my system, and again, the coil needs 10 psi at full flow, at design conditions, and now we have a very large valve. A very large valve produces a very small pressure drop. So what happens? When the valve is wide open, like so, and the throttling plug is at the upper end, then I have full heat. In fact, as I start modulating this valve down, I'm still at full heat. In fact, it might not be at until I'm at this point right here, where the plug is getting very close to the seat that I start hitting my 10 psi. And that is still at full heat, at design conditions, which is probably only a few days in January. As this goes on, as, as, it's warmer, or as it gets warmer outside, the valve then starts to modulate even further to the point where it is very close. When this happens, we have wire draw happening. As the velocity of the water goes past here, it causes very large cracks in the disc and seat. Also, the valve can't find this place. Since you've eliminated a large portion of this, the lift, it has a very, very hard time. It hunts back and forth, up and down, trying to find this position. This is an oversized valve, and it is a very common problem. In this last example, let's walk through it as it's done correctly. Again, using the same figures, 20 PSI is available. Our coil requires 10 PSI for full heat. And we're taking a pressure drop equal to 50% across the valve. In this case, that would be 10 PSI. Notice now that as the plug is at the top, like so, we will have full heat. As it gets warmer outside, the plug will start to modulate down. When that happens, the pressure drop increases and the heat output will decrease proportionately. This gives us the maximum amount of control along our lift. This has been sized correctly. Here's the third major control application of the pressure drop chart. Proportional temperature control of water. In this application of varying the temperature, you can see that the temperature to our load is changing, but the flow through the load is remaining constant. When we have this type of valve, we want a very low pressure drop. Low pressure drop, what we mean by that is 20% of the available pressure. So if the pressure from the pump was 20 PSI, then the pressure drop I want across the valve will be 4 PSI. Proportional control of steam is the last major control application related to pressure drops. From the chart, it may be seen that a division occurs between low pressure drop and anything less than 15 PSIG steam and a high pressure, obviously more than 15 PSIG steam. 
on low pressure steam, 80% of the inlet gauge pressure should be dropped across the valve. Because of the nature of steam and its heating abilities, requires a larger pressure drop for proper control. Here are the examples for taking the pressure drop for proportioning control of steam. The first one here is low pressure steam. You can see I have 10 PSI coming in. From the determining pressure drop chart, we were to take 80% of the inlet pressure dropped across the valve. In this case, the pressure drop across this valve would be 8 PSI. That sounds like a lot, but that's the correct amount that will make this system work correctly. The bottom one here is high pressure steam. 25 PSI is coming in. In this example, then, I would take a pressure drop equal to 42% of the absolute. How do I figure that? Take your gauge pressure plus 14.7, which is atmospheric pressure, which gives you 39.7. 42% of that would give you a pressure drop equal to 16.7 PSI. As an example of how to use the determining pressure drop chart, let's take a look at this problem. Here I have a cooling coil and a three-way valve. And I'm going to size that valve. Question then becomes, what pressure drop do I want across it? Well, it's a three-way valve on the return side of my coil. And I ask myself, do I want to vary the flow or vary the temperature? Well, in this example, I'm varying the amount of flow that goes through the coil. If that's the case, I want a very high pressure drop. Or, as you might remember from the chart that we just talked about, that means 50% of the available pressure dropped across the valve. Or a pressure drop equal to the coil. Well, let's figure that out. Now, in determining the pressure drop on this example, let's say that the available pressure is not known. So where do I go? I go to the cooling coil schedule, and I take a look at the pressure drop across that coil, in this case, 13 feet. I need to change that 13 feet into PSI. So I take the 13 times 0.433. That will give me 5.5. So I have 5.5 PSI. That's my pressure drop across that coil. Now. Across this coil also, then, I have a temperature rise. In this case, 20 degrees. Referring back to note two on a determining pressure drop chart, that means that I have to have the multiplier of three. So I take the pressure drop across my coil times three. That gives me a pressure drop of 16.5 PSI. That would be the pressure drop I want across my valve. Now that pressure drops have been explained, the three methods used to determine CV will be explained. First, the water systems will be covered, then the steam systems. In the water systems, we have three ways to determine the CV. They are the formula, nomograph, or the chart. Each one of these will be explained in detail. The first of the three methods is the formula. Let's use an example as follows. We have a two-position, two-way, stem-up open, which is a normally open, valve. The coil requires 10 gallons per minute, and we have 20 PSI available. Putting those numbers in the formula, we have CV equals our gallons per minute for the coil was 10, divided by the square root of the pressure drop. The pressure drop we need, again, going back to the de determining pressure drop chart, is a very low pressure drop, 10%. 10% of 20 is 2. Working then the formula out, 10 divided by the square root of 2, which is 1.4, we get approximately a CV of 7. Now the formula method is very accurate, but it takes time. The second method here, the water nomograph, is much quicker. Let's take a look at it. We have three separate columns, the, the pressure drop, gallons per minute, and the CV. 
Using that same example, let's see how this problem works. First off, we had to find our pressure drop. Our pressure drop in our last example was 2 PSI. Our gallons per minute was 10. Lining those two up and drawing a line and reading our CV, you can see that we have a CV, again, of approximately 7. The advantage of the nomograph is it is very quick. The disadvantage is it can be very inaccurate determined on how wide your pencil is. The third method here is the chart. And again, sizing the water valve, we can take a look at this and see that on the top, we have the differential pressure. This is the pressure drop. In our example, using that same one, we wanted a pressure drop of 2. Now taking that and going down the 2 column, we go down until we hit our gallons per minute, or as close to it as we can get. In this case, 9.6 as is close to the 10 gallons per minute as we can uh, get. Moving then to the left, you'll see that the CV is written right there. In this example, it is 6.8. This method is very quick also, but not all the pressure drops that I need are shown. This chart is available in the green catalog. The next area to be covered is steam system sizing. As the same as in water system sizing, we have three methods. They are the formula method, the nomograph method, and the chart method. Each one of these will be covered in detail. Here's our first example, the formula method. In the example that we have here, we have 220 pounds per hour, and the system pressure is 10 PSI. Let me explain the letters first. Q stands for the quantity of steam, in other words, in pounds per hour. In this example, it would be 220. The K stands for the amount of superheat. For most of our examples, we could ignore this. Down at the bottom, you can see 3 times the square root of, here's our pressure drop. And again, you'd have to go back to the pressure drop chart to determine what pressure drop you should have. Times P2. P2 is the pressure on the downside of the valve. As an example, if I have a valve here, and I have 10 PSI in our example, as you, as you see, and my pressure drop is equal to 8, I have a 2 PSI left over. That's P2. Now let's work this in an example. You have CV equal to 220 divided by 3 times the square root of, in our example we said 8 is our pressure drop, times our P2, and this again has to be in absolute. So you take the 2 PSI plus atmospheric pressure of 14.7, and you have 16.7. Working this entire formula out, you'll find out that the CV comes out to be 6.3. Here's the second method in finding the correct CV using steam. Here's a steam nomograph. Notice the columns that we have here. You have the pressure drop across the valve, the inlet pressure, the quantity of steam, and the CV. Here it's already drawn out for you. You can see the pressure drop we wanted was 8. The inlet steam was 10 PSI coming in. Drawing a line between those, we have a new base point. From that point, you take that through your pounds per hour or your quantity of steam, in this case 220, and you come to a value here of approximately about six and a half. So we have a CV of approximately 6.5. Here's the last method for st finding the CV for a steam valve. Let's take a look at it. And that's the chart method. Notice at the top we have our inlet pressure. 
we are going to take the inlet pressure of 10. Now that column here is subdivided into two columns. Here it says one on one side of it and eight on the other. The one, or the one on the left, stands for two positioning. The one on the right stands for proportional control. In our example, we wanted proportional control for the steam valve. So we will go down the pressure drop of eight. Going down this column until I hit my quantity of steam that I have. In our example, again, approximately 220. 215 is as close as I'm going to get. Taking this all the way to the left, the CV that I want is 6.2. Once you've determined a CV for either the steam or the water valve, you need to go to the valves to find out how close you can come, finding an actual CV. The other was a calculated CV. In our examples for the steam valve, we had a calculation of 6.3. It's very obvious then that you take the one closest to that, in that case 6.2. So our calculated CV would be 6.3, but the actual CV would be 6.2 because that's what the valve has. In the water system, it's a little difficult. 